In Space, No One Can Hear You Clean. Written by Nico Tatarovic. Read by Vic Reeves. July the 8th, 2024 had been coming since the beginning of time. But for Beth Tanner, it arrived out of nowhere. For four years now, she had dutifully mopped, waxed and polished mile upon mile of vinyl flooring in a building that had become the pride of Hampshire. Beth was humbly placed as a level two hygiene technician at the RP Galactic Center of Space Exploration in South Britain, as it was now increasingly referred to. Despite the fading tabard she wore on duty, she didn't feel lowly at all. RP himself, better known as billionaire entrepreneur Robert Pickle, knew Beth by name and somehow managed to make her feel mildly valued every time he tiptoed over her slippery floor, trying not to leave the footprints of his incredible wealth. Once, he even bought her one of her beloved Sudoku puzzle books for her birthday, having noted that she was up to Grandmaster level. Here she is, the Grand Master, he would say to her as he passed more than a bit patronisingly, if we're honest. The RP brand had already reimagined, reclaimed and repackaged everything from cola pop, pet insurance, flying to America, potatoes and boutique palliative care. Now it was branching out into trying to colonise the planet Mars because it was red and therefore very much in line with the RP brand. But RP Galactic weren't the only team actively trying to claim the Red Planet as their own. Our dear old friends the Russians, equally betrothed to the angriest of all colours, were desperate to make it first. And the world knew that just one technical slip-up would allow the Russians to leap in front and use Mars to, no doubt, worrying ends. Beth showed no signs of concerning herself with the rights and wrongs of competing to claim an entire planet. She simply got on with the job in hand. One morning, Beth clocked into work as usual and set about her well-rehearsed Wednesday routine of giving the shuttle a good going over. Twenty minutes later, and deep in the bowels of the craft... She was in full hardcore cleaning mode. Beth liked to work in tabulated bursts. 40 minutes of graft, five minutes of Sudoku. She was in the midst of one such stolen puzzle break when boom! Suddenly, the shuttle's engines roared into life. And so it was that on Thursday, July the 8th, 2024, Beth unwittingly became the first cleaner in space. Meanwhile, in the cockpit, things were going smoothly. Telemetry system operational and good. Velocity good. Requesting gravity mode, offered the commander. Gravity mode engaged, replied the pilot, as their buttocks simultaneously relaxed into their leather seats. OK, let's take this baby to Mars, declared Pickle. The three crew smiled and began to settle in. This was, after all, going to be a long journey. All three had trained long and hard to prepare themselves for all eventualities. Well, except for the one that actually happened. Sorry to interrupt, Mr Pickle, announced Beth. Shit! exclaimed the billionaire, not unreasonably. What the hell are you doing here? I think I might have got me days mixed up, she blushed, her hand pressing against her heart. I think what it was, was my sister usually picks me up for Zumba on a Wednesday night, but last night she was having a spray tan done before she goes to Kavos. It's thrown me routine right out, she spluttered. Oh, and you got your days mixed up. Well, that's OK then, Beth. You know, I mean, we're only on our way to Mars. Just then, a radio crackled into life. Uh, everything all right up there, guys? Over. A monotonous voice asked. The commander shushed them all. Shh. No one was to know what had happened until they decided what to do. 
Um, yeah, everything hunky dory. Over. Just dealing with a, um, a hygiene issue. Over. He improvised. Now what do we do? Pickle asked the commander. Well, according to procedure, I have no option but to initiate a stage six mission realignment. Deadpanned the flight commander. A man more used to scientific order and planning than harebrained flights of fancy by monomaniacal billionaires. Okay, what's that? asked Pickle. We turn around, drop her off, and start the whole mission from scratch, answered the flight commander. Impossible, thundered Pickle. It'll take six months to prepare for launch again. Standard procedure, not the end of the world. Not the end of the world? This has cost me seven billion pounds in any way. The Russians are only three months behind us. Oh, bugger, bugger, bloody hell, Beth, he raged, punching his scrawny little legs. The flight commander stepped in. Now, Beth, have you touched anything or done anything that could endanger the life of anyone on this craft? I hope not, she answered. I always say, never flick a switch without flicking it back. That's one of my cleaning rules. Great. Really cool, said Pickle sarcastically. Then he buried his head in his hands, doubled up and started rocking backwards and forwards. Beth had never seen him like this before. A man who seemingly knew no limits was now crumbling before her very eyes. He lifted his head and stared at her with deadened eyes. Okay, here's what we do, said Pickle. She comes with us, but she remains in the holding cell. No one, and I mean no one, must know she's here. It would completely undermine the mission, he stated, by which he meant they would all look like dicks. Before briefing her not to engage with any operational interfaces, the flight commander showed her various flat surfaces around the craft that were safe to polish, keen to keep her busy. After six hours of lights down, the crew awoke to the sound of Beth's chirpy whistling. She opened a door to find a panicked-looking commander cupping his genitals and then quickly snapped it shut again. Nothing I haven't seen before, she chirruped. Just letting you know, I've done all the panels. What panels? asked the commander nervously. The flat panels, like you said, just the flat ones. The blood in the commander's face drained away. What is it? What's she done? asked Pickle. Beth grabbed the nearest handle and winced as hard as she could. I'm afraid she's ejected the reserve fuel tanks. This was not good news. This time, Pickle rolled into a ball on the floor and just punched that. No, 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 he whined. The commander cleared his throat. <clears throat> I hate to say it, sir, but maybe that stage six isn't such a bad idea now. The risk of non-specific, non-positional malplacement is too high. Do you ever talk English? hissed Pickle. We're basically more likely to get stranded in space where we might, you know, die in things, so maybe best to just pop back home, sir, shrugged the commander. No! shrieked Pickle instantly. Never! I will not have my dream ruined by a stupid cleaner! So much for the Grand Master, thought Beth. The commander swallowed hard and steeled himself. Very well. We can still just about make it, but there's zero room for error. Beth, you are to be confined to the refreshment area and your sleeping quarters. Am I understood? Yes, she replied sheepishly. A few days passed without incident, but being the industrious type, Beth could keep herself from doing nothing no longer. She rooted about in the cupboard and found some tubes of various concentrated ingredients. Lamb, onion, carrots, potatoes. She had what felt like a smashing idea. Surely doing the lads a nice casserole would go some way to winning them all over again. What is it they say about men and their stomachs? 
such something, anyway, she murmured to herself as she emptied all four tubes into a mixing bowl and boiled the shuttle's kettle. Four minutes later, she had been locked in her quarters for her own good. How was I to know one tube was meant to last 12 months, she protested. Her little gesture had used up nine months of ultra-dense space food in one serving, and it hadn't even been edible, effectively creating a brick of unusable lamb stew that weighed over 200 kilograms and had broken the kitchen top. I'm ever so sorry about all of this, Mr Pickle, she offered carefully. As soon as we get back home, I'll move myself on to passages new. I'll hand in my notice. Robert looked up coldly. Oh, there's no need to do that, Beth. You've already been sacked, he said. You know, I've been thinking, he added darkly. Nobody actually knows that you're here, do they, Beth? Beth felt a scream rise up in her, but Robert had covered her mouth with his hands. Shh! That's it, Beth. It's over now. Didn't anyone ever tell you that in space no one can hear you scream? With that, Pickle tried to push Beth inside the airlock. He hadn't noticed the power cord from her floor polisher caught around his foot like carbon flex coated poison ivy. He began to flounder and fall forward, inadvertently sending himself into the doorway that marked the point of no return. The door hissed closed behind him. Beth observed the confusing control panel and furrowed her brow. None of the commands were straightforward. And as Pickle tapped hopelessly on the glass, grinning his insincere grin, Beth took a lucky dip on the buttons. She watched Britain's greatest business mind float away into the blackness. The mood was understandably somber that evening. It had been decided that now would be a good time to tell ground control that there was a cleaner on board, that the richest man in Britain was dead, in space, and that they were on their way home. The thorniest issue, however, was video evidence from the shuttle's cameras, which showed that Pickle had apparently tried to murder poor old Beth, and that she had tried to rescue him from the airlock. Many livelihoods and the sales of hundreds of products relied on his good name. I mean, who would drink the cola of an attempted murderer? Back on Earth, at the RP headquarters, there was to be an ultra-top-secret board meeting to discuss the way forward. The world would be told that Pickle bravely went outside the craft alone to perform essential repairs and had been lost forever, like in that film. It was the perfect marketing ploy, but it did rather depend on nobody ever finding out that one Beth Tanner had been allowed to accidentally wander onto the shuttle and then effectively destroy the mission single-handedly. So with that in mind, the commander was charged with explaining to Beth that she was welcome to have her job back. No hard feelings, but that she must keep very, very quiet. I won't say a thing, Mr. Commander, sir. I just want to get back to my cleaning. On Beth's first day back on Earth, all was normal down at RP Galactic HQ. The floors were just as vast and smooth as always, and the routine felt as familiar as her favourite dressing gown. She thought how she might miss going over Mr. Pickle's suave little footprints with a polisher, but I suppose he'd made a rod for his own back, see? Thinking himself better than others. So she didn't let it trouble her too much. Beth paused briefly and pulled out her phone and carefully dialed a number that she'd inserted into one of her Sudoku puzzles. Hello, dear, she then continued in gentle, fluent Russian. Which roughly translated meant The Grand Master is pleased to announce that the British space programme is over. 
do let me know when I can be of service again. Well, whoever you were rooting for in that story, I'm sure we can all agree that we never quite stop learning who we can and can't trust. And whilst it's all very well having money and status, it's whether you secretly work for a foreign intelligence agency that really counts. Goodbye.